Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a very special guest today, a Professor James Heffernan, uh, Professor Emeritus at Dartmouth College. And uh, he has a new book on politics and literature in World War II. But also, uh, James has a, a distinguished career as a humanistic scholar and at a time when the humanities are under threat with a big push towards STEM. Uh, he is one of the great uh, intellectuals of our time who we believe should be heard more from uh, in the, on the public airwaves, you know. And so, uh, but let's begin uh, with your new book, uh, James, uh, on World War II. It's Politics and Literature at the Dawn of World War II. And uh, kind of timely with the Ukraine situation now. What do you think? Incredibly timely. Uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine has, in fact, brazenly reenacted exactly what Hitler did to Czechoslovakia uh, in the fall of 1938 and then uh, to Poland uh, in September of 1939. And it's uncanny how closely uh, Putin has followed uh, Hitler's script, uh, because if you look at what Putin said, I think just two days before February 24th and his invasion of Ukraine, he said that he aimed to uh, liberate uh, ethnic Russians, uh, millions of ethnic Russians, uh, from the tyranny, the neo-Nazi tyranny of uh, the Ukrainian government. Well, it's ridiculous on all kinds of fronts, uh, one of which is that uh, Vladimir Zelensky is, uh, is Jewish. He's nothing like a Nazi. Uh, but also uh, remarkable is the fact that just before he invaded uh, Czechoslovakia, Hitler said that he was aiming to uh, rescue three and a half million ethnic Germans from being tortured by the Czechs. This was a total lie. They weren't being tortured by the Czechs at all. But it's a very similar kind of justification uh, that both men are using. Hitler, uh, sorry, Putin is, uh, is, the, is, is almost the reincarnation of Hitler in our time. But of course, we're, we have a very different result in the sense that uh, well, the Nazis simply rolled into Czechoslovakia uh, uh, with the acquiescence of uh, Britain and France, which had pledged to defend that country. Uh, now we have uh, the U.S. and various other countries uh, uh, uniting to support Ukraine, and Ukraine is putting up one hell of a fight against, uh, against uh, Putin and the uh, Soviet army. So it's a very different result. But the onset of it all is very similar to wow. what happened with, with Hitler. Wow, wow. Well, again, this uh, points out the fact that those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and we're looking forward to your book coming out. It's going to be published by Bloomsbury Academic on December 1st. Thank you, yes. So we're really looking forward to that. And when you went about uh, research for this book, uh, James, who were, the, who were the writers that first came to mind? Obviously, Hemingway. Uh, was one, uh, Bertolt Brecht, and, and what was your process of thinking this through in terms of which writers you thought were representative? Well, it's, it's a very good question, uh, and if I may back up a little bit to, you know, the origin of the book, it actually started out, believe it or not, as a kind of veiled autobiography. I was born in April of 1939, and uh, a few years ago, I had, after my last book came out in 2014, I had the idea that I would do uh, a kind of autobiographical history. That is to say, I would write a history of the year 1939, and uh, rather quixotically, my own birth would somehow be part of the events of that year. Uh, that quickly dropped out, but I, I did actually manage to write um, a straight history of the major events of that year, starting with the shuttle diplomacy of uh, Chamberlain flying back and forth from London to Germany, uh, in late September of uh, 1938. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, seizure, the Nazi seizure of Czechoslovakia. And then the long courtship, and I think this is not sufficiently recognized, that Hitler actually courted Stalin starting in January of 1939 uh, in, in, in order to finally reach the so-called non-aggression agreement of August 23rd, uh, 1939. And a secret feature of that uh, agreement was, of course, that the Russians and the Germans were going to divide Poland between them. Those are the terms of which uh, Stalin agreed to to that non-aggression agreement. Uh, 
And then finally, uh, what I call the crucifixion of Poland, uh, the absolutely devastating attack on that country, which in spite of uh, putting up very brave resistance, it was very different from Czechoslovakia. Uh, the Poles fought back bravely, but they simply didn't. They were, they were largely a 19th century army uh, with horses and wagons uh, fighting a, a 20th century army with uh, tanks and, and planes, and they just, they, they just couldn't do it. So I finished that, actually, uh, I think around 2016 or 17. And I showed it to a friend uh, who was a very seasoned uh, publisher of academic books. And uh, we had lunch together. The first thing he said when he sat down is, this is potted history. And I was a little chagrined at that. <laughs> My God, you know, he said, there's really nothing here new that any historian would find that would he would regard as new. And I, I, I sat in the car afterwards and I had a little, little talk with myself. And I said, look, you're... Your training is in literature. You're not an historian. Uh, what you have to do is get back to literature. You have the historical framework. Now what you need to do is consider what some the great writers of that period did with the outbreak of the war. And suddenly I had my, uh, my, my book. I think you know the, the basic distinction here is that history records the past. Literature recreates it. And uh, I started with Auden's poem, September 1st, 1939, which is uh, certainly a landmark, even though it's kind of ironic because he, he finally disowned the poem. But I think it's a remarkable expression of what he felt at the time that he heard that the war had broken out. And uh, then once I had that, and I thought uh, gradually, I, I began to realize Hemingway had written uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, which was inspired by the Spanish Civil War. And he he rightly called the Spanish Civil War the dress rehearsal for World War II. So it seemed to me that that would be logically uh, the first one to uh, consider. Uh, and then Bertolt Brecht, of course, because uh, here is an extraordinarily uh, creative mind, a poet and playwright. Uh, he, he leaves uh, Germany. He, he had to get out. He would have been killed, uh, uh, if not simply arrested, uh, in in. Uh, early in 1933, shortly after Hitler took power, uh, he left the country and he ended up on the island of Funen, uh, Svenborg Sound in Denmark. And there for about six years, he wrote a series of absolutely fascinating poems. Uh, they were published in, finally in 1939 as the Svenborg Dicta, the Svenborg Poems. Uh, and they're a record, a kind of fever chart of his response to the news that he was getting from Germany. Uh, they are just richly uh, uh, ironic and satirical, and uh, they play all kinds of fascinating games with the language, with some of Hitler's favorite words like uh, Sieg and Krieg. Uh, and uh, then finally, he, he leaves. He has to leave in April of 39. He has to leave Svenborg because Denmark is about to be overrun by the Nazis. And he goes to Stockholm. And from Stockholm, he sees the war breaking out, uh, first of all, you know, September 1st, 1939, and then comes September 17th. And that's when he learns that the Soviets have invaded Poland in alliance with the Nazis. And he is absolutely flabbergasted. This is because he's an ardent Marxist. And even though his, he soured on, on uh, Stalin, he still believed this time the Marxists were going to save the world and to see that Soviet Soviet Union had invaded Poland from the east in order to uh, aid uh, the Nazis who were invaded from the west, he was absolutely shattered. And what he does is to sit down and write what is probably the greatest anti-war play of all time, Mother Courage and Her Children. It's an absolutely brilliant account of the futility of war. Uh, and then finally, I thought, uh, you know, I learned about the so-called phony war because after war began in September 1st, 1939, um, the, the uh, Nazis invaded Poland, but then really nothing else happened. Uh, the, the French and the British, essentially the French, uh, made a, a very uh, feeble uh, attack on German forces in Saarbrücken uh, in the northwest of Germany. Uh, and then just scuttled back because they were afraid of provoking Hitler. They were afraid of being bombed and they really did nothing else. So essentially nothing happened until the British tried to defeat the Nazis in Norway and they failed. That was in April of, uh, of 39. And then finally the, the war only ended really when the Germans invaded France 
uh, in uh, June of, uh, sorry, in May of uh, 1940. And in a couple of weeks, they had just uh, overrun the country. And uh, that's what leads to the exodus within France, uh, which, by the way, has been reenacted by the uh, the displacement of millions of uh, of uh, Ukrainians uh, in the in the most recent war. Uh, there was something like eight to ten million French people who were driven out of northern France into southern France, uh, into the Vichy, this, this technically unoccupied part of France, and uh, and then I I, I realized that. That is the historical event that had been commemorated by Irene Nimirovsky, who is this absolutely fascinating uh, Ukrainian born, by the way, uh, writer who moved with her family to France uh, in uh, about 1913, I think, uh, and became a very accomplished novelist. She decided in the wake of this invasion to write, to do her own version of Tolstoy's War and Peace. Talk about ambition. I mean, this is a woman of you know, maybe 36 or something like that. She decides she's going to do for France what Tolstoy did for Russia in War and Peace. She's going to write, she's going to write a series of novels about these events. So she actually only wrote two of them. She wrote one, the, the whole thing is called Sweet Francaise. Uh, the first novel is called Tempest in June, uh, Tempest in June. Uh, and uh, that's all about the uh, the invasion and the exodus, uh, as it's now called, of all these French people moving south. Uh, and then finally, she writes uh, Dolce, which is about the occupation of a French town. And then finally, um, you know, and, and this it actually worked out chronologically pretty well. Uh, the final chapter is, uh, oh, sorry, I should say that I mentioned the phony war <laughs> the, uh, the sort of classic novel about the phony war is written by Evelyn Waugh. It's called Put Out More Flags. And uh, it's uh, it's an expose, really, of the farcical, uh, of, the, of the farce of uh, uh, British resistance uh, and, and a highly skeptical view of, of the whole notion of heroism. The main character, Basil Seal, uh, devises mar- various means of keeping himself out of the war and out of doing anything useful until finally the end, uh, he says, you know, what I, I think I'm really meant to do is kill Germans. He's, he's going to be turned into a killing machine. That's what finally happens at the end of the novel. But anyway, sort of jumping over then uh, the exodus in France in uh, the summer of 1940, uh, finally we wind up with what happens in, in England starting December 7th, uh, 1940. <clears throat> the British are bombed in the London Blitz, and it goes on for 56 nights. And can you imagine that? Unceasingly, the, London is bombed for 56 nights. And the very first night, it's an apocalypse. The, the uh, bombs hit the London docks, and they burn tons of wood. Uh, it's a terrible fire. And that's the episode, the, the, uh, the event, that is recalled by a, a British novelist named Henry Green. He's not very nearly well known as Graham Green. Graham Green spells his name with an E at the end. Henry Green has no E. He's, a, he's approximately a contemporary of his. But he served in the Auxiliary Fire Service in uh, London for, uh, I think, over a year. And uh, it's on that experience that he bases this novel called Caught, which is an absolutely fascinating study Again, uh, highly critical of the notion that the firemen are heroes. Everybody else, you know, in the, the, the propaganda line is that they're all heroes. They're fighting for Britain. Uh, he exposes that um, many of them are anything but heroic. And most of them are preoccupied with sex. Something, again, historians hardly mention. But if you have a lot of single people in London and their spouses are off in the country for the sake of safety, uh, and, and you know, it, they, they know they may be killed at any moment. Uh, and you've got a pub around the corner and an opportunity to jump in bed with uh, anybody you, you wish. I mean, the temptation is obvious. So it's actually a, a story of, of war and sex uh, and also a spectacle. Uh, there's a long passage uh, near the end of the novel, which actually focuses the, the main character is recalling for his wife his experience of fighting the fire on the very first 
uh, Night of the Blitz, uh, when the wharves are attacked. And uh, what he recalls, among other things, is the absolutely spectacular sublimity of the mile-high tongues of fire leaping into the sky. And again, this is something that, uh, you know, historians seldom have ever talk about. They talk about the destructiveness of the fire, the brutality of bombing and so forth. But the idea that this this flame gushing out of the uh, out of the burning uh, wood at the, the warehouse, you know, should be should be almost an object of artistic or aesthetic appreciation uh, is not something historians deal with, but it is very much part of this novel. So, uh, as I say, uh, you know, they're in different ways. They're recreating the experience of the outbreak of the war and they bring to it, uh, uh, you know, a kind of imagination and, and passion uh, that you seldom find in history, which is, as I say, the record of the past. Wow. Wow. Uh, you're, this is amazing. I mean, nobody, very few people do uh, this as well as you, James, in terms of literature, right, literature, history and politics and how the three of them kind of dance together. Right. But let's contextualize this to the present moment. OK. Our president, Joe Biden, made a very yeah, yeah. important speech uh, about the dangers to democracy right mm -hmm. here in the United States. We have mm -hmm. a, a, an uprise of fasc fascistic activity right here yes, in sir. America. Yes. So, so, you know, you talk about Chamberlain and how he basically just gave in to Adolf Hitler and how the lessons of you don't give in to a bully, you know, and, and, and how, how can we sort of learn lessons from that for the present moment from, from literature, from the arts and from your work? How can we, you know, how, what does this mean to our moment today when we see a rise of authoritarianism, not only in Russia, mm -hmm. but also in other parts of the world, including in the United States? Well, wow, that's a very big question, and uh, let me see if I can tackle it from various angles. Let me first of all say, on behalf of Chamberlain, Chamberlain, Chamberlain has had, in a sense, a very bad press from history uh, uh, because he's, of course, simply remembered as an appeaser. I think to be fair to Chamberlain, you have to remember how the First World War ended. Uh, oh, you know, the, the, the consequences of the First World War, 20 million people killed 21 million people injured, many of them maimed for life, countless millions more whose lives were shattered by the deaths and injuries to their loved ones. When you remember that, you have to realize that Chamberlain was going to do anything he possibly could to avoid getting into another war. Uh, he, he, you know, why he wanted to appease. And, and of course, the, the, uh, the, the English, many of the English, not just Chamberlain, kept telling themselves every time it would make a move. Well, that's all right. He has the right to do that. And they, they want to go out of their way to sympathize with his feelings of uh, a resentment at the humiliations inflicted upon him by the Treaty of Versailles. For instance, I'll give you one example. He was forbidden to remilitarize the Rhineland, that is to say, to remilitarize the western half of Germany. And when he did that in March of 1836, the British said, oh, well, he's just stepping into his backyard. But well, what he was doing was, of course, putting his artillery within easy range of eastern France. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, talk about uh, modern day similarities. Uh, when uh, Putin seized Crimea in 1914, we, we have to, uh, sorry, in 2014, uh, we huffed and puffed, but really did nothing. He saw that he could get away with doing that. And uh, every time he got away with violating uh, a, a norm or a treaty, uh, he thought, well, OK, I could just go on and, and do it further. OK, so <clears throat> what do we do with uh, a bully uh, like Hitler or like Putin? Well, what we've done so far, I think, is remarkable uh, in terms of our support for uh, Vladimir uh, Zelensky, who clearly is I think maybe he's even more than the Churchill of our time. Uh, he's an extraordinarily heroic figure. His determination to defend his country, and it's really remarkable when you consider he was a he was a comedian, a TV comedian, and all of a sudden he's the embodiment of defiance and courage and determination in Ukraine, standing up to Putin. And it's true that he's got all kinds of weaponry uh, supplied by us, but in terms of morale, he is the leader of his people. 
And only today I, we read that the uh, Ukrainians are retaking some some property from uh, territory from the uh, from uh, from the Russians. Uh, so it, it's going to be a long slog. It's very difficult to say how it's going to come up, but it's very very different from this Nazi seizure of Czechoslovakia. So I think we are standing up to Putin insofar as we can without getting into another world war. We do not need. We do not want another world war. And after all, since the second war, which ended, of course, with the incineration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the last thing we want is uh, another nuclear war or a, a war involving nuclear weapons. And this is why we're so understandably uh, alarmed about the Russian seizure of the nuclear plant at uh, Zaporizhia uh, and the possibility that the Russians may use nuclear weapons of their own. I don't think they will, but, you know, it's still an alarming possibility. Now, as for the other topic on the whole question of humanities and the, well, it's related to uh, Biden's uh, critique of, of uh, the MAGA movement and so forth. Uh, if you shift over into, say, let's say, the status of the humanities in our time, I think it's getting it from various sides. Uh, and first of all, I mean, if you go, go down to the lower grades uh, the, and the public schools, it's certainly getting it from the right. And I, I, I think it's I, when I read these stories of what is being done to teachers these days, especially in Florida and other places, this one teacher, for instance, uh, when uh, she was told that she had to remove a certain number of books from her library, gave her students uh, a, uh, a link to the online uh, 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 bibliography of the uh, library in Brooklyn uh, so that they could they could check books out digitally from Brooklyn. She was threatened with being fired for doing this, mm. for simply giving her students access to books in the Brooklyn Library. And many other examples of this, of, student, of uh, teachers who are being told they can't, uh, any, any mention of race, uh, raises the specter of critical race theory, uh, and uh, anything involving homosexuality must be forbidden, and so on and so forth. I mean, Teachers are some of the hardest working people we have, lowest paid, hardest working, and now they're being hit with the threat of surveillance and firing if they uh, step out of line in any way. So on the other side, at the more advanced levels, uh, you, you have actually humanities getting hit in a way from the left. Uh, the left, at least for the last 30 years, uh, and I mean the, the sort of extreme progressive left has been <clears throat> deeply skeptical of anything written by uh, dead white males, uh, sometimes alarmed by the fact that uh, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn has one single use of the N word, uh, you know, that is seen as objectionable. Uh, and uh, I think there's a desire on the part of the left, uh, not, not altogether deplorable, but still questionable, to enlist the humanities in the cause of anti racism anti-sexism, uh, racial, sexual diversity, and so on and so forth. Let me give you one example that's, I think, tangentially related to this, but nonetheless potent, I believe, in its own way. I don't know whether you've heard of what happened at Oberlin now. Uh, in 2016, a young black man walked into a bakery that is right opposite the college and shoplifted a couple, apparently, it is, it is said, shoplifted a couple of bottles of wine and went out of the store. He was chased by a member of the family that owns the bakery, a young white man who ran after him. And uh, the black man was joined by a couple of his black friends and there was an altercation. And this led to a protest by students who denounced the bakery as racist. The school took the part of the bakery and a case went on for uh, about four or five years. The bakery charged that the school was defaming it. Uh, and, but the result of all this was that uh, the school has been hit with a judgment of $36 million. That it has to pay to the bakery for having defamed it. Now, where this impinges, I think, on the humanities is simply this. I believe that the study of the humanities includes the study of logic, uh, in fact, if you go back to the Middle Ages, the so-called medieval trivium included logic, grammar, and rhetoric as the three pillars of a humanistic education. If you study logic, 
if you learn to weigh evidence dispassionately, this would not have happened. I think the obligation of the school would have been, first of all, to investigate the case thoroughly and find out you know, whether, in fact, the student did take the bottles. And then secondly, to study the history of the bakery itself. Were they hiring any black workers? Were they disrespectful of black customers who came in? You need a thorough investigation. And then you would really have to say to the students who are all too ready to rise up against what they see as racism and say, no, this is what we have discovered. And you could seize this as a teachable moment, uh, as an experience, the need for careful analysis before you jump to conclusion. Instead, the student, the, the officials, the college threw itself right in behind the students, and they are now having to pay quite literally a huge price, something like uh, 36 million of their their endowment is a little less than a billion, so they're probably paying uh, the equivalent of a year's return on their endowment. Uh, and they've said, well, you know, we've, we've figured out a way to do this, but come, it has to be painful. And I hope it does teach a lesson to other schools. Okay, so now then there's a bigger, perhaps an equally potent uh, source of pressure on the humanities. Uh, which comes neither from the right or left, strictly speaking, but what I would call from the pragmatic middle. And that is, uh, and this is, I think this problem is exacerbated by the cost of uh, college education right now. I mean, it's approaching, it's around 75000 80000 the full ticket cost. It's, it's rapidly approaching $100,000 per year per student. The costlier college education becomes the keener the demand for evidence that it's delivering marketable skills. Even Barack Obama, whom I greatly admired, said a few years ago that he thought you could measure the value of a college education by simply looking at the average salary of the alumni 20 years out. You, you can measure it in monetary terms. Well, this is you know, a serious problem for the humanities if they are if they are going to be judged simply on a utilitarian basis. And I have seen this uh, evidence of this at, at Dartmouth, where I've been teaching for many, many years. When I first came to Dartmouth, uh, well, a few years before I came to Dartmouth, I should say, every Dartmouth student had a two-semester freshman course in the humanities. And they would start with Plato and uh, Homer and Virgil and so forth, and they would come right up to the present day. That actually, just before I arrived, was shrunk to two quarter uh, term courses, uh, one of which was freshman English uh, composition, and the other was a, a seminar on some topic of literary interest. Now, what was interesting is that for my first few years at Dartmouth, the freshmen were all required, every section, that not some of them were exempted, but something like two thirds of them were required to take freshman English course. They're required to read Milton's Paradise Lost, King Shakespeare's King Lear, and Melville's Moby Dick. I mean, these are three cla classic works of literature. And uh, uh, Paradise Lost uh, is, is very challenging indeed. It's richly Latinate language and it's studded with allusions and so on and so forth. It requires a lot of work. But I will tell you that uh, one uh, member of the English department, uh, uh, an African-American man who joined the, uh, uh, the department uh, in around 1970, I think, his name is Bill Cook, and I, I recall him with great admiration. He taught that poem to students who were just coming in. They'd been admitted as freshmen. They were black students he, in, in, in the summer before. He would, he would teach that to them. He loved that poem because of its... Uh, rhetorical grandiloquence, the, uh, the, the drama of Satan, uh, who sets himself against what he calls the tyranny of God, and the absolutely fascinating relationship between Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, and, and, and King Lear, of course, as a study of family relations, absolutely fascinating. And finally, Moby Dick, you know, the great works of uh, epics of, of American literature. Now, these things have simply faded out. Uh, because uh, they are the works of, you know, dead white males and so on and so forth. And they're too difficult for our students. And so we do a lot of other things. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, extremely unfortunate. Uh, 
I think I, I wrote a piece on the humanities that you saw, I think, on the American Scholar website uh, about why we need the humanities. And the, the very fact that we have to defend, justify them right now, says something about our own time and our relationship to the humanities, uh, because it used to be that their value was taken for granted. Now it is we are living in, in an age of STEM. And I can tell you, if you want numbers, that uh, when I started teaching at Dartmouth in the mid-60s, uh, something like uh, over 10% of the class, something like 120 students, uh, would end up as English majors. That number has fallen by half. So uh, in, in, in trying to uh, you know, simplify the curriculum or simplify the requirements, uh, we haven't really gained anything. Uh, I, I, I said years ago, you know, it used to be that because they all studied Paradise Lost, it was wonderful. If you taught later literature, I, I taught a course on Romanticism. The Romantic poets were steeped in Milton. And when I taught Romanticism, I could always assume that most of the students were familiar with Milton. I could, I could allude to Paradise Lost and they know what I was talking about. But after a while, that, that was no longer the case. And I, I said, I used to conclude that the only text that the, all the students had in common was a college catalog, period, nothing else. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I think the, what, what I don't think my colleagues, uh, younger colleagues who are now still teaching, and I'm, I'm retired, but my younger colleagues are still teaching, sufficiently recognize is that for this generation, we need to justify the humanities. We can't take their value for granted. And we can't spend all of our time talking about theory uh, which has been dominating the teaching of literature for the last 30 years, and certainly since Derrida, uh, but that we have to talk about what the humanities teach us about humanity. And I, I talk in that article about the, the paradox that the word inhumane cannot be applied to anybody but human beings. It, it doesn't, it's ridiculous to talk about lions and tigers and scorpions as inhumane. Only human beings can be inhumane. This is the, the paradox of it all. And, but we have to realize that. We have to realize our capacity for inhumanity before we can discover what it means to be humane. I cited the example of a story by Phil Cly, a Dartmouth alumnus, author of a, set, a group of stories called Deployment, a Redeployment, which won the National Book Award back in 2014, I believe. And in one of his stories, uh, he has this character who says uh, that uh, all his life revolves around killing hajis. I mean, that is sort of killing the Muslim enemy and everything else is just none. And I, I said, I think that the only shred of humanity he has left is the consciousness that he has been turned into a weapon of war. That's, that's all that's left of his humanity is the consciousness of what has been done to him and how the war has deformed him mentally and psychologically. Uh, and uh, so I think we need literature like that, uh, you know, like Phil Clay's uh, book, and we need the humanities uh, to understand what it means to be human. And, and I, frankly, I think there's nothing more precious, never mind its market value, there's nothing more precious than our need to understand ourselves as human beings, what it means to be human. Amen, amen, and I applaud you for that, uh, James. And you should be saying this in the halls of Congress. Um, <laughs> well... Just a little bit about our connection now, you and I, because yeah, yeah. we were both educated by Jesuits. Ah, very good. Yes, yes, I, yes. I, yes. I learned that by doing research on you and uh -huh. sampling some of your wonderful YouTubes on James Joyce and on, oh, yes, on, yes. Ja on Jane, right. Jane Austen. You did the great book series. Fantastic. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. anybody who wants to uh, learn more about your work can just Google you and see this incredible, you know, stuff. And but. Um, you know, the other thing is that, so my English degree in literature was from Fordham. That's where I uh -huh. got the Jesuit. Then, then, I, then I went over to NYU, and I got uh -huh. a little more radical, radical energy there. You know, I got a master's in English education, you know. Very good. And, you know, one of our guests, former guests of our show, was Judith Molina, the pioneer uh -huh. of political theater. And she mm -hmm. learned a lot from Brecht. And so this uh -huh. idea that theater and politics can go together. Yes. Uh, another one of our guests, Stanley Aronowitz, uh -huh. uh, uh, was an important critic of higher education, the corporatization mm -hmm. of higher education, mm -hmm. which you're also mm -hmm. talking about. Another one of our guests, uh, James Shapiro, uh, 
one of the oh, leading sure. Shakespeare he's scholars Dar Dar for a year or two. Uh, as I knew, I, I, I keep up with him. Yeah, he's, I he's always try to, very, uh, yeah. quite remarkably well. He's a, amazing, amazing. I'm a renowned Shakespearean. He's wonderful. And then also Harold Bloom. We were able sure. to get to Harold Bloom. I think we I gave him his last interview up, you know, in his home, yeah. in his home in New Haven. And he mm. was railing against the. Um, the death of the humanities in the academy, okay? Yes. And he made the link between that and the rise of fascism and even mentioned Donald Trump by name. He said mm -hmm. that, you know, once you get rid of the humanities, you get Donald Trump, okay? Yes. Yes. So just yes. to be clear about that, that we're facing yeah. this yeah. rise of ignorance in America. Right. We're facing an anti-intellectualism, right. right? We're facing a dumbing down. Mm -hmm. and, and I really think, you know, there was a Woody Allen movie, I forget which one, but he said he was telling his girlfriend that he was, uh, he was in the Humanities Regiment. He said, I was, we, were the oh, we, yes. we, were, we were the first on the beaches at Anzio, the Humanities oh, yeah, Regiment, yeah. you know. So you and I, we're, we're in the Humanities Regiment, you know. But the question is now, I have to you, is how can we get this out there? How can we influence policy? Now, my doctorate now, I'm studying at Drexel. Okay, yeah. and my doctorate will be in educational leadership and management, with a mm -hmm. focus on creativity and innovation. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of freedom to bring in imagination and literature and those mm -hmm. topics there. But I'm focusing on cinema, mm -hmm. and the topic of my dissertation is: uh, imagine a Hollywood for the greater good. Imagine uh -huh. a Hollywood for the greater good, and I yeah. think that also comes into play with movies. And, and stuff like that. My father was in a play as a young man. He was in the Kane Mutiny Court Martial. Oh, I, I was in that play myself. You were in that play. <laughs> <laughs> now not. we have a, another link here. This is amazing. I played one of the officers, one of the interrogating officers. I've forgotten my, the name of my character, but I remember that play. Uh, my, my father played a, a, a character who brought comic relief. He had a small part. Uh, Junius Urban uh, was his okay. name. He comes in at the end. He wasn't really in the movie, but he was in the play version. So that's okay. another example in terms of cinema. When I think of World War II, and I think that uh, obviously the writers you're, you're covering here in your book, but also the movies really help to keep the morale strong. You know, mm -hmm. and so what is your anything to say about the, the link between literature and cinema and even the overall sort of in our culture today? You talk about marketing, how there's a marketing emphasis in the colleges. I think there's a marketing emphasis all over and it's happening in our culture, in, our, in Hollywood. There was an op-ed in the New York Times recently that talked about why art is getting boring. <laughs> and, and this is why we're dealing with it. Everything has to be cleared by the marketing department. Can anything yeah. be done about that? What can be done about that? Oh, boy. <laughs> Another huge <laughs> question. Okay. Um, yeah, what I do is I write books and op-eds, and uh, I support my local uh, Democratic candidates, frankly. Uh, uh, they're up for re-election this, this fall. But uh, on a larger, you know, more historical level, um, it's interesting. You, you mentioned these movies, which were morale builders. Uh, and uh, there's a fine line between building morale and propaganda. Hmm. Uh, and I remember growing up on, you know, the sands of Iwo Jima and going and, of course, rooting for all of our heroic figures and uh, how wonderful the war was. Well, uh, the the standard reading of World War Two is it was, it was a good war. Uh, and Tom Brokaw, of course, written this book about called The Greatest Generation. <clears throat> I don't want to mention any names, but I can tell you that the. Yeah. A brother of a man I knew, a younger brother of a man I knew, who uh, served as a sergeant on one of the Japanese islands, not Iwo Jima, but one of the other islands, said that he had never spoken to his brother or anybody else about what he did on that island because he was afraid he would go to hell for what he did. Uh, if you look closely at things like that, you discover the war was not so good after all. Not to mention, of course, that the war did not end well for the nations of Eastern Europe, which found themselves behind the Iron Curtain at the end of it, or for the 220,000 Japanese civilians, men, women, and children who were incinerated in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of it. Um, if you go back, see what fascinates me about the literature ignited by the imminence and outbreak of the Second World War is that these are writers, <clears throat> and they're not exactly appeasers, 
but they don't share the gung ho attitude of many others, in spite of the horrors that that uh, Hitler had committed. And it's interesting that right after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December seventh, uh, writers of America got together, and you know, thousands of them said, "We commit ourselves to defending America." Basically, we commit ourselves to propagandizing for America. Uh, one of the, what I do in the first chapter of my book is to look <clears throat> at Hitler and FDR, but also at the Partisan Review, uh, which was very definitely a left small magazine founded in New York by a couple of brilliant 26-year-olds in the early 30s. They conducted in uh, the uh, spring of 1939, they did a survey of major literati uh, in New York. Uh, oh, people like uh, Lionel Trilling uh, and uh, Gertrude Stein, uh, uh, Kenneth Fearing, uh, uh, the, the U.S., the guy who wrote USA, uh, John Dos Passos, and so on and so forth, uh, Wallace Stevens, uh, <clears throat> a number of major writers in and around New York, and I said, asked two very interesting questions. One, uh, what do you think is the writer's responsibility in time of war? And two, what are you doing about it? And several of them said... The writer's responsibility in time of war is to tell the truth, not to lie about it. Uh, some others had various kinds of evasive reactions, including Henry Miller, who said, I'm not going to fight at all. I, I don't care. I'm an absolute pacifist. It's over. But a few of them said to tell the truth. And of course, that's what Hemingway tried to do in uh, the to for whom the bell tolls. Uh, and it's quite interesting if you compare his, and I'm not, this is not my uh, original thought. I'm 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 drawing here on a, a very important article, uh, comparing his reporting on the war with his novel. And when he was reporting on the war, he felt bound to be something like a propagandist. That is, he felt bound to defend the loyalists, uh, the small R Republicans, uh, those who are fighting the fascists. He felt bound to uh, to uh, foreground the brutality of the fascists and to suppress anything nasty done by the loyalists. When he came to his novel, he set out to reveal that the loyalists, in fact, were just as vicious as the fascists or could be. And of course, the loyalists were, were led by the Soviets and the Soviets were absolutely ruthless. And he reveals all this in the novel. And the, the problem he's facing is embodied in the character of Robert Jordan he is a killer who hates killing. This is what's so fascinating about Hemingway's own ambivalence toward the war. He said it was a crime against humanity, but he also told F. Scott Fitzgerald, war is the greatest subject of all for a writer, and, and civil war is the best of all because it concentrates so much that otherwise you have to you know, uh, spend a long time getting. So he's fascinated by the war as an object of literary recreation, even though he's horrified by what it does. So the thing, what is really interesting about this, uh, I say this at the end of the book, uh, I, I, in my epilogue, I quote Churchill's uh, speech after Dunkirk. <clears throat> uh, that is after the British had succeeded in evacuating about 338,000 soldiers, mostly British, from the beach uh, at Dunkirk, uh, northwest France, they were surrounded by the Germans, and there was no way they could fight their way out of it. But the British managed with this flotilla of, you know, hundreds of small boats and so on and so forth to get about 338,000 of them out. And Churchill stands up to give a speech, and he says, we must not give to this evacuation the, uh, you know, the, the color of victory. But he utters the, the famous words, that I absolutely love, uh, a superb example of rhetoric, even though large tracts, and understand at this point, Britain is alone against the greatest war machine ever assembled. Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall defend our island, whatever the costs may be, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight on the hills, we shall fight on the streets, we shall never surrender. And these are stirring words, of course, and I, I find it very difficult to even recite them without getting excited. 
But there is <laughs> nothing like that in the literature, ignited by the outbreak and the imminence and outbreak of the first war. All these writers are deeply conscious, of, first of all, of the terrible slaughter of the First World War, and secondly, deeply skeptical of any ideas about heroism. This is the, 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 the collectively, these works of literature amount to a critique of old fashioned heroism, deeply dubious about its value, especially when war is now being fought with weapons like, you know, bombs and uh, tanks and uh, machine guns, no, no longer swords, anything like that. So, yeah. uh, so that's the problem that we're we're up against in, in dealing. I mean, literature complicates things; it always does. It, it, it the best of literature refuses to be enlisted uh, in a propaganda war for any cause. It's always highly critical of that, and and deeply sensitive to the human cost of anything that you do in war or anything else. As and I cite, I mean, I, I don't cite Oppenheimer in the book, but in the in the article that I mentioned. Uh, that we spoke of the American scholar, that I, I, what what Oppenheimer's, you know, the father of the atomic bomb said, after what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the physicist has known sin, and this is a knowledge which he cannot lose. Oppenheimer refused to discount the staggering, catastrophic human cost of what they had done, mm. and he wouldn't have anything to do with more of these weapons. He just wouldn't do it. No. And and it was therefore lived under, lived under suspicion for the rest of his life. You know, he thought he was a traitor hmm. uh, because he was allowing humanistic feeling, uh, humane feeling, to uh, triumph over uh, you know geopolitics. Hmm. So. Hmm. Wow! And of course, Mary Shelley taught us something about what Very happens sad. when science Indeed. is yeah. untethered to any kind of moral grounding, and you That's get right. this monstrous. Uh, uh, phenomenon that comes out of that, and yeah. when, when you mention yeah. Henry Miller, who's actually one of my favorite writers, uh, I, I love yeah, I love yeah. Miller. You know, when I discovered that his childhood home is still in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, I got so excited, and I actually <laughs> make I make pilgrimages over there on okay. Drig Street. But it's still the brownstone is like still there. I I literally. <laughs> I literally touched it as, as a museum. As, as no, a, they haven't done anything. It's just there. Okay, okay, people, just there. Pe people walk right by. They have no clue. No, no little blue plaque or anything. On there. Not even a plaque. You know, I, I go there. I touch the door. I'm like, oh my god, this is this is. Good. Uh, in fact, that's where I went to begin reading Henry and June. By the way, when I when I found out he was there, I had never read Henry and June. Which was by okay. An Anais Nin. That was her memoir of their love affair. Oh yeah, I haven't I haven't read that either myself. So, uh, so that was that. But when you mention Miller and pacifism, I also yeah. I also thought of Tolstoy, and mm -hmm. I've I've been doing a lot of research on Tolstoy because he wrote a novel that very few people know about called Resurrection. It was his third yes. novel, yes. and this was about love and social justice. Okay, mm -hmm. it was his most political, provocative, and best-selling book. And it uh, actually was the basis of a movie in 1912 that was mm -hmm. that was lost, and because it was lost, it was forgotten. And yeah. that movie was starring one of my relatives, Blanche Walsh. She was a wow. forgotten actress. Yeah, she actually created the prototype of a movie star in that uh, film. In that film, yeah. right? So, uh, see, because that movie was lost from 1912, Birth of a Nation, which came three mm -hmm. years later, which was a horribly, you know. Talk about propaganda. That was a racist yeah, yeah, yeah. film that depicted black people as stupid and lazy and dangerous. Right, right, and and right. Woodrow Wilson screened it at the White House, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I actually have the story of Hollywood's much happier beginning through, uh -huh. through Resurrection. And, and, and that's going to. Oh, resurrection made, was made in Hollywood. No, it was, it was a Hollywood. It was before Hollywood. It was actually when Hollywood was on the East Coast. But oh, okay. it was a feature film, all right? It was yeah. 40 minutes long. Before uh -huh. that, before that, movies were short. They were ten minutes, mm -hmm. fifteen minutes. You know, right, it right. was it was Adolf Zucker. He was the grand mm -hmm. architect of Hollywood. Uh, yeah. It was the founder of Paramount Pictures. But before Paramount, his initial company was called Famous Players Studio, mm -hmm. and it was famous famous players and famous plays. His mm -hmm. idea was mm -hmm. to get stars from the stage. And my relative Blanche Walsh was the leading Broadway star of, of her day, oh, and she st yeah. she starred in the play version of Resurrection in 1903. Oh, 
So then, then Zucker brought her on board to elevate motion pictures to an art form. I see. So it. Hollywood itself had a much, mm -hmm. much more moral, ethical, literary, and Tolstoyan birth. I'm trying to get the story out about that uh, yeah, to help yeah. complicate also what movies are and what they could be, you know, mm -hmm. go, going mm -hmm. forward. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, I want to read this also before we go any further, talking about Tolstoy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Jay Perini, who yes. you know, writes these great novels about literary yes. characters, and one of them is called The Last Station. Uh, oh, yes. which was about Tolstoy's final days. Claudia and I, my darling wife, who's here, by the way, I want a shout out to Claudia, she's right here, Hi, is my Claudia. darling wife, you know. You? And just to tell everybody, we had a hard time getting this thing going with the technology. Two English professors here stumbling through <laughs> with the Zoom. Thank God for Claudia. She's, uh, she's a scientist, and she got us going. But anyway, we saw the movie version of, mm -hmm. of the last station when it was playing at, yeah. the, at the Angelica in downtown Manhattan several years ago and just uh -huh. loved it. But I want to just read what Jay Perini says about your book, okay? Mm -hmm. And here's what he says. He says, one rarely dips into a book of literary criticism for pleasure, not these days, but Heffernan's brilliant study of major writers, mostly novelists and poets, on the brink of the Second World War is both salutary and inspired. It is also compulsive reading. Looking at an unlikely crew that includes Hemingway and Brecht, Auden, Wolfe, Waugh, and Henry Green, Heffernan shows how the terrifying imminence of war excited and refined the imaginations of these writers. This is a book to savor and one that sends us quickly back to the writers under discussion. And that's Jay Perini, American novelist, poet, biographer, and critic. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and he also taught at Dartmouth, right? He did teach at Dartmouth for several years. I knew him very well, and I keep in touch with Jay. He's a good friend. Yeah. That, that's so wonderful. That's wonderful. But I love that, that this is a book that will send people back to reading the actual mm -hmm. works. And of course, you know, we're also very grateful to Ken Burns and his brilliant documentary of Hemingway uh, last, oh, la last yep. year, which was just absolutely, yes. you know, and to get us excited about the dead white guys, right? I mean, exactly. what, yes. what, what, yes. how, how can we, you know, what's that all about? I mean, there's, there, there mm -hmm. is that politics, that cancer right. culture that we're fighting. It's very complicated. It's very complex. But it's the pleasure and love of reading. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I've heard it say that if you really want to get turned off to literature, study it in college. <laughs> you know, because they turn it into a chore. They turn it into a chore, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and so with your work, uh, we really get to feel that love. And, and I think, you know, you really are very invaluable to our culture and, and to get out there. Are, are you going to be on tour for this book? Is, it, is that going to be? I haven't planned anything. Okay. Uh, I'm giving a lecture on it at Dartmouth uh, in November on uh, Armistice Day, in fact. <clears throat> uh, but uh, no, I haven't planned any tour, any book tour. I'm just hoping that uh, word will will get out about it. I, I do want to say, uh, if I may, just as a sort of last word, <clears throat> is that this is categorically an academic book. It's published by Bloomsbury Academic. Bloomsbury Academic is a division of Bloomsbury. And academic books are, uh, you know, traditionally considered written for an academic audience, for fellow teachers of English and so on and so forth. I have striven to make this as readable and engaging as possible. So I hope it will interest anybody who is interested in uh, the Second World War uh, or literature or the relationship between literature and history, which is a continuing object of my analysis. Wow. So, so. Wow. And as we sort of wind down here, uh, James, maybe you could talk a little bit about what got you excited about literature when you were a young man, uh, any particular writers, or how did that happen? Or you know what, I have a two-word answer to that question, okay. and it is my father. Oh. I grew up with a father who loved language and literature, who quoted Shakespeare, Dickens, Coleridge. Huh. I first heard the lines of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner from the lips of my father. Oh. So uh, I really credit him with uh, steering me into literature. He didn't uh, never sat down and advised me. He said, "Oh, you should become a literary critic." He never said anything like that. Just that 
that I, I grew up, you know, sitting around the table hearing him talk about Dickens and Shakespeare and Coleridge, and uh, and then I just started reading on my own, and and uh, you know, one thing led to another. I mean, that's that's the short answer to your question. Uh, 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 that uh, I majored in uh, English and philosophy in college, and I thought, well, I'm I'm sort of you know going to have to choose between the two, and I finally decided, well, I really want to write about study literature. So that's what I did. And uh, I, I really wasn't sure whether I wanted an academic career or not in my senior year of college. Uh, but I heard about the uh, Woodrow Wilson Fellowship for Graduate Study. And as a condition of that uh, application, you had to say that you were seriously considering a teaching career. So I wrote that down. And the result of it was that I did seriously consider a teaching career. And then that I did choose that. So there you are. How wow. these things develop. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention a very important conference at Dartmouth that happened in 1966. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Where that was the first time English teachers from other parts of the world came together mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. discuss the best practices of teaching English. And right. one of the things they found in that conference is that English was not being taught very well in the United States. Right. It was very right. top down, hierarchically, it was yeah. done with textbooks and drills. And, mm -hmm. and so we started to get away from that after this Dartmouth conference, and people started mm -hmm. experimenting using whole language, more dialogue, you know, and stuff right, like right. that, and more based on letting people talk about their own feelings and react yes. to text. Yes, it yes. came out of this Dartmouth conference, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. and it seems like in the last 30 years, we're getting away from that. So we're trying to launch an effort to transform education at the national level uh, mm -hmm. to bring the humanities back and we'd mm -hmm. love to stay in dialogue with you, James, on this, you know, and, okay. and trying to maybe even get Jill Biden. Jill Biden has a doctorate in education, you know. Sure, we yeah. could bring her yeah. into this conversation, because if, if Joe Biden says we have to save democracy, mm -hmm. schools are, are a great way of doing that. I mean, yes. people who go and vote, they have come out of a school system, and so they either have a democratic ethos or they don't. <laughs> right, right. And I think literature can help give us that democratic ethos. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Thank you so much, James, for My uh, pleasure. spending this delightful hour with us. And uh, good luck on tour and uh, good luck with your work. And uh, you are a national and indeed an international treasure. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. That's very kind of you. Very, very generous. Okay. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I guess the leaves are turning yet? Are the leaves? The leaves are starting to turn. Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah. uh, we got to get up there sometime. All okay. right. By all means, do. Thank yeah. you. Okay. All right. Thanks, bye bye. Take care. See you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Okay.